Well, I'm very happy to have uh, Russ Franklin with us today, a former national serviceman. And um, I just want to say, I'm sorry, we haven't actually been able to interact with more of the territorial, the TF guys and the national uh, servicemen, because um, when you focus on some of the bigger names that came out of the out of the war, it's quite easy to forget just how big a contribution the the national servicemen made to the whole effort. And sadly, there were lots of casualties in amongst those ranks. And Russell is one of those casualties. So um, it's a sad story, but it's also a story, I think, of personal triumph, if I might just add my little um, bit to this. But Russ, um, thanks again for being here. Uh, you're very welcome. And um, I'd, I'd ask you to maybe start off with your early life and how you ended up in the military. Thanks, Hannes. Thanks for inviting me to join um, in this. And um, for clarity's sake, I'd like to just start off by saying that um, your series is called Fighting Men of Rhodesia. I'm not sure I qualify um, because I actually only had one contact that I was involved in, um, in my time in the military. And I only ever fired 20 rounds in anger um, however, um, my big fight really started um, once I'd been blinded and that was my big uh, fight was um, to try and recover from, from those injuries. So hopefully some people might find this interesting um, and yeah, if anybody does, that would be great. So to kick off um, my early life, I was born in Rhodesia and I went to school at St. John's Prep School and a few names from St. John's that you might know because they they ultimately joined the RLI. Uh, my best friend at St. John's was Gordon Thornton mm -hmm. um, and he uh, ended up, I think he was a captain yes. in the RLI at yes. some stage and Craig Bone the yeah. famous artist, you you would obviously know him, yeah. and Chris Cox, the author of, of the book Fire Force. So I was at school with all, all those guys. So, Hannes, you, you would know some of them, would you? Yes, I, I, know, I know all those chaps pretty well. Yeah, yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so, uh, that's where I started school at St. John's. Um, and once I'd complete, finished at St. John's, I went on to Oriel Boys High. Um, did reasonably well there, um, academically, but, um, but uh, most of my triumphs were on the sports field. I was in the first 15 rugby for about three years. And I was on the, in the athletics team. I represented um, Mashana Land, um, for javelin and 400 meters and um, for a couple of years I was in the swimming team but my main sport when I was um, a teenager was was archery which I obviously didn't do through the school but I did that outside the school I was very very keen on archery and um, in 1975 I qualified for the Montreal Olympics, which were to take place in 1976. Right. And um, another thing that I did as, as a teenager, I did quite a lot of shooting, a little, little bit of hunting, but um, quite a lot of target shooting. Russ, so those where, where were- was home? Where, were, where were you living? Were you in, in, in Salisbury or were you outside? Yes, I, li I, I lived in Salisbury, yes, yeah. Exactly. The Montreal Olympics never it never came to fruition for Rhodesia, as I remember. Rhodesia were banned. No, that's right, exactly. But in any case, I was called up. Um, I finished school in 1975, and I was called up to go um, into to, to the army in January '76. 
So in actual fact, I wouldn't have been able to attend anyway. And let me just ask you, Russ, uh, just, this is a, it's a process that every Rhodesian, well, not every, but a lot of Rhodesian schoolboys went through. When you were called up, what were your thoughts about what happens next? Did you, did you give it much, much thought about the rights and wrongs and what you were doing? Because some chaps did, um, did feel that it was contrary to their convictions uh, and, and everybody's entitled to an opinion and um, preferred yeah. not to uh, go and do their national service. You obviously thought differently. So to be honest with you, I was quite keen because I would listen to the news and I would hear what was going on in the borders. I was quite keen to get in there. I had applied for Natal University to do engineering. And so I had the option of going to university in 1976 or going to the army. And I made the decision that I'd like to do my national service first, get that um, over and done with, and then go to university after that. So that's the decision that I made. Right. So, so I was called up. Um, I was to um, appear at um, Cranbourne Barracks in the January of 76. It was intake 150. That was um, the biggest intake that it occurred at that stage. I arrived at um, the barracks in Cranbourne and um, had decided that what I would do is I would try and um, get onto the officer's course, School of Infantry in Guela. And so I applied for that and went through the, the selection at Cranbourne Barracks and was successful and went through to the next phase of selection, which took place um, in Guela, the School of Infantry. So we were bundled onto the train, sent down to, to Guelo and spent, uh, I don't know, I think it was three or four days there going through the selection, um, doing various activities and so on. And to my surprise, ultimately I was selected to attend the, the officer's course. So yeah, I stayed there at, um, at the School of Infantry and um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, I obviously found physically it was it was tough, but I think everybody found that it was physically very uh, challenging. But because um, of my history of shooting and archery and things like that, uh, put a rifle or a, 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 a machine gun in my hands and I was very happy. <laughs> so I, um, I got my marksman colors uh, for the FN rifle, for the MAG and the Browning um, light machine gun. So, yeah, I, I did quite well on, on those sort of things. Who were your, who were your instructors, Russ? Hmm. Do you remember? But, uh, yeah, there, was, there, were, there were quite a number. There was uh, uh, a, a color sergeant, Miller, Robinson, there was a Captain um, Willis. There was a Captain Rishworth. Quite a number of of, of characters. Um, those are the ones that I remember uh, most of all. Okay. And um, yeah, it was a good time. I really enjoyed it. I, uh, I really got a lot out of it. Um, thought it was great. A good, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'd rate that as a, a highlight in my life, really. Right. And um, so, yeah, not everything went perfectly. Um, we went out on a, on a camp um, the one time and uh, I was assigned to guard duty and um, woke up in the morning and thought, mm, nobody called me to guard duty. So obviously something's gone wrong. Somebody's going to be in big trouble. And they went through and traced it backwards to, to work out um, who had missed their guard duty. And to my surprise, it was me. So, 
So what had happened is the guy who was on guard duty before me had come to me and he'd said, Russell, look, wake up, wake up, you're on duty now. And I'd said to him, no, no problem, I'm awake. And he'd said to me, but look, the rules are I'm not allowed to leave you until you've got out of your sleeping bag. And I'd said to him, no, no, don't worry, don't worry, I'm awake, I'm awake, I'm up, I'm up. And so he said, okay, no problem, and off he went. And <clears throat> I'd obviously fallen back to sleep and I had absolutely no recollection of having any conversation with him at all. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a bad mark. I expected at the end of that week to be RTU'd, returned to unit, because they were RTUing half a dozen people every week. So I thought I was going to be sent back to, to the RLI. But to my surprise, at the end of that week, uh, my name wasn't called out. And to this day, I don't really know why. I guess maybe some of the instructors instructors saw that I was I was keen and decided to give me a second chance. Right. But anyway, at the end of um, the course, um, I was I qualified as a sergeant, and um, you know many of the the guys there qualified as second lieutenants. I guess maybe um, my age, because I was a school leaver, was was one of the factors, right. and also perhaps the fact that I'd blotted my copy book by sleeping uh, through my guard duty maybe contributed to that as well. But anyway, look, I wasn't unhappy. I figured that as a sergeant, I was more likely to be able to get out um, patrolling and things like that. Um, than if I was a second lieutenant. So no, I was, it was good, I was happy. And you were posted to one of the independent companies? Yes, yeah, so, so I was posted to 6 NDAP, um, which was a new unit that was operating out of Adams Barracks um, in Amtali. And um, this, the um, commander of that unit was uh, Major Pearson. Um, he was from the RLI. And the 2IC was Captain Knight Willis, who was um, from the SAS. And incidentally, uh, Captain Knight Willis was a Kiwi. And since I've been in New Zealand, I've met up with him on a few occasions. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was in the SAS in, in New Zealand, and then for um, reasons only been known to him, he, he, he decided to go to, to Rhodesia and, jo and join up there, so he was in the SAS there. So really great guys, fantastic leaders. Um, it was a, a real privilege to serve under them. And... Um, so yeah, so I went up to, to Amtali, to Adams Barracks there. And um, a couple of days later, the, the troops arrived. Um, we had brand new equipment. All the trucks were brand new. All the uh, rifles were, were brand new. So um, the troops arrived and we uh, uh, gave out the the weapons and the ammunition and so on and we went to the the range and and spent some time there um, zeroing our rifles um, but literally a, a, it was about a week after they arrived we actually got deployed up to north Nyanga to a place called Rwangwa which was part of the St. St. Swithin's TTL and uh, um, that's where we set up our ba base camp. Um, we set up our base camp uh, ad uh, adjacent to a BSAP camp. Um, and unfortunately, along the one side was a ridge, probably about 150 meters from the camp. It overlooked the camp. And um, it was very rocky ground, so we weren't able to, to dig 
trenches. We dug a few trenches, um, but but that was the best we could do. And we had some sandbags, so we set up a few sangas. But you know, we it it wasn't wasn't a great uh, location for a for a base camp. To be fair, Russell, was this was this a company deployment or a platoon? No, a company deployment. Um, yeah, all the uh, the company the, the the company went out there. Right. <clears throat> so from there we started uh, patrolling, and um, it was a fairly hilly part of the world, mm. and um, it was very difficult to, you know, to be fair. Um, we we did a lot of patrolling. We set up OPs. Um, we set up ambushes overnight, but in reality, we 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 didn't have a lot of luck. We struggled to 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 find these guys. We knew they were coming um, over the border from Mozambique on a regular basis, bringing in. Um, weapons and landmines and setting them up and and there were also people that were flowing out of the country through that area so we knew it was very active but we didn't we 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 struggled to to get into contact with these guys and um, we came close a few times where we found positions where they had slept overnight um, but, um, you know, by first light, when we found these, these places, they were gone, long gone. And we'd, we didn't really know how to follow up on them, you know. Um, sort of thinking in retrospect now, it would have been really good if we'd had some professional soldiers sort of like assigned to us, possibly some guys from the RAR or something. Because... You know, we we were blundering around, patrolling, and we were doing our best, but we really didn't. Skills. We didn't. We didn't really know um, how to get how to you know get into contact with these guys. And I think Russell, making your making it tougher for you, that um, that part of the country was was I think quite heavily infiltrated and subverted. Uh, I think the, oh, yeah. the populace were, were very pro the enemy. So you were probably being watched by civilians, by the locals who would have been reporting back to the enemy. Um, and so you were probably, you know, you, you, had, you had a tough task uh, under those circumstances. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we'd set up an OP and at first light, we'd look down through a valley and there'd literally be hundreds of paths through the valley. You could you could see them. And that night we'd come down to set up a, a, an ambush, but you literally had, you know, hundreds of paths that you could you could ambush. And it was a question of which one do you choose? You know, it was very difficult um, mm. to 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 know how to how to get in contact with these guys and it became very frustrating um, got very frustrated but the one um we had some int from a local to say that um, our base camp was going to be attacked and um and so we 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 got together we we decided on our deployments and i was assigned to an MAG on a on a tripod at the back of the camp, and that was where my position. And so, I went there and um, spent the night uh, sitting by my machine gun, uh, waiting for the attack to commence. And of course, nothing happened. And so, the next night we did the same again. I sat by the machine gun waiting. And again, nothing happened. So the following day, we all met and we said, look, obviously this, this it is a lemon. Um, it's obviously perhaps they've changed their minds. They're not going to attack. 
so we'll stand down. Um, so we went back to our normal sleeping positions and I was sleeping in the, um, the non-commissioned officer's tent and I woke up that morning at about 3.30 with mortar bombs dropping all around, around the tent. Uh, uh, massive flashes and a uh, huge noise and I jumped out of my sleeping bag, grabbed my rifle and ran out of the tent and, and jumped into a, a trench which um, was close by to the tent. And I looked up at this ridge um, and I, it was literally like a, a, a Christmas tree with all these lights flashing as these guys were um, firing the AK-47s down on the camp. And we subsequently learned that there was something in the order of 90 of them who were um, involved in this attack. And um, off to the left, I could, I could see that there was these big flashes as they were firing um, mortars at us from, I think they had two, two mortar tubes and subsequently learned that they had um, a recoilless rifle that they were also using. And so they were bombarding the camp. Um, mainly, you know, the, the main effect was from these mortars and a very accurate, the, from the, the, the very first mortar bomb landed slap bang in the middle of the camp. Because the ridge was only probably about 150 meters away, so not far. So, <clears throat> so I uh, fired off uh, the 20 rounds that I had in my magazine. And that's all I had because I didn't have my webbing with me. And then once I'd done that, I decided ah, what I'll do is I'll go and man the machine gun at the back of the camp. So that was a sprint probably of a of hundred meters, I would have to run up, uphill to the back of the camp about a hundred meters. Um, so I leapt out of my trench and I started to run and I actually only got about three or four meters um, when a mortar bomb went off a um, few meters on my left hand side. Um, blew me off my feet. Um, I hit the ground. I couldn't see a thing because um, I was blinded. I didn't know that at the time. I just knew I couldn't see. So I did, I uh, crawled 180 degrees and went back towards the trench or where I thought the trench was. And I was very fortunate because I found it and flopped into the trench. And um, there were a bunch of guys in the trench and they were crouching down at the bottom of the trench and I just flopped down on top of them. So I was lying on top of these, these guys, um, bleeding like a stuck pig. And, and <clears throat> as I was lying there, I, uh, I was investigating my, my injuries. And <clears throat> I had... One piece of shrapnel had gone through my left eye, gone behind my nose and cut the optic nerve of my right eye. I mean, I obviously didn't know that at the time, but I did know that I couldn't see. And I did know that my left eye uh, felt like, um, I don't know, a tomato that somebody had thrown against the wall. Um, I had a piece of shrapnel that had hit me in my left arm. It had broken my arm, broken my collarbone. There was a big donger in my arm there. Another piece had come in uh, through my ribs, between my ribs and punctured my left lung. Another piece that was about four inches long had gone into my abdomen and punctured my stomach. And then down the left-hand side of my leg, I had some, some fairly big pieces of shrapnel that had, 
had hit me in the leg. Mm. And so there were some quite big holes in, in, in my upper and lower leg. So as I lay there, I was investigating all of this and there were like little rivulets of blood just running. And um, I could feel the, the blood was filling my left lung. And so I, um, it was becoming increasingly difficult to breathe. So yeah, as I lay there, I, I thought, well, you can't bleed like this. Um, but you're going to die. And I, I had a very strong feeling that I, I was going to die. So, um, so Hannes in the back of, in, in, uh, quietly in my head, I just said, look, Lord, will you save me? And to this day, Hannes, I believe that he did exactly that. And I guess the, the lesson I learned from that is, you know, when you are confronting death, you've run out of options. And basically the only option you have available to you is to, to call on the Lord. And I think, you know, although that was a situation in time back then, we all actually confront that issue at some stage in our lives because we all die. So I think as we get older, we, it's something we need to think about. And then who came to your aid, Russell? So, um, so look, the attack carried on. I don't know how long it lasted. I, um, I think maybe about an hour. And, um, and the um, company um, CSM, the um, CSM Morgan, had managed to get to one of our mortar tubes and was, uh, was returning fire. So we were, we were returning fire to some degree and the attack um, ended. And then the medic was able to come to me and put an, a line in my arm and put a tube in through my chest to, to try and drain the blood from my lung, which he did. And then they flew in medics. Um, I think three choppers came in at first light and Kazavakt us out. And um, I th there was 12 people Kazavakt out. Um, fortunately, nobody um, in the camp had been killed, but um, 12 people had been injured and um, three of us seriously. And there was David Garvin, who you know, was seriously injured. Um, Trevor Blythe, who was very seriously injured and myself. And so we were Kazavat out and we were flown to Andrew Fleming Hospital. Russell, I'm just, I'm just going to interrupt very quickly because this is quite emotional for me listening to you tell the story because I actually remember when this happened yeah. because my family and the Garvin family were very, very close and, and David's mom and my mom were probably best friends. And I remember oh, yes. being at home when the phone rang and my mother going very quiet on the phone. And it was Thea, David's mom, uh, sure. to tell her that David was yes. in terrible trouble. I actually get very oh, yeah. emotional thinking yeah. about it. Um, yeah. Uh, and they, they weren't sure he was going to survive. Um, no. David... David also managed to find his way out of it. But anyway, so all yes. this brings back quite a few memories for me. But carry on. So you ended up in Andrew Fleming? Um, yeah. And actually, through the series that you're doing, I got into contact with Basil uh, Connell Jones yes. um, a couple, couple of days ago. And um, he was telling me that he was on fire force that day. And he was flown into Rwangui, um to do a follow-up. And um, he, did, he, he did that. His fire force group did that. And they pursued these guys towards the Mozambique border. And he said, 
there were so many of them, they were quite nervous. But as they got close to the Mozambique border, they were really worried that they were going to be ambushed. Um, but then the heavens opened and it, it, uh, <coughs> it, it rained really heavily, wiping out all the, the spore. So because of the rain and because of the failing light, they decided they, they would call off the pursuit. And so, yeah, it was good to, to talk to somebody who had sort of been, been involved in the follow-up. I know the police, the BSAP, um, did find uh, 10 bodies um, after, you, you know, after the attack. Um, so there had been some, some casualties on the other side. So yeah, so ended up in Andrew Fleming, um, spent some time there uh, till eventually I got bored and discharged myself. And, um, but obviously, look, I, I, I had some fairly significant injuries and it, it, it did take some time to recover. But in the December, <clears throat> my brother-in-law and sister um, took me up to Kariba um, to have a little bit of a holiday. And that's where I met my wife, Karen, who I'm still married to today. We're about to celebrate our 43rd um, when a wedding anniversary in a few days. Well then. Yeah, so um, so my big problem, uh, when I was in Andrew Fleming, I lay there and I kind of contemplated the future. And I realized that if I was going to live a normal life, um, you know, sort of get a job, um, get married, have a family, all those sort of things, I was going to have to do something extraordinary. And I determined then that I would do that. I would do everything in my power to make sure that I could recover both from my injuries and also from my disability. Funny, funny thing is, at no stage did any doctor come to me and say, hey, look, Russell, we've got to tell you you're blind. It was just, I just kind of had to figure that out for myself because I couldn't see <laughs> but um, yeah anyway so uh, I discharged myself from hospital <clears throat> and I started doing um, rehabilitation training with the Dorothy Duncan Centre in Salisbury and that basically consisted of of learning to type learning braille um, mobility skills and that sort of thing nice. but the, the following year I went to St Dunstan's in the UK now St Dunstan's was an organization that was set up during the first world war to help people uh, who'd been blinded in action um, rehabilitate and they had a facility in Ovendine, which is near Brighton. And I went, I went there. Massive complex. I think in its heyday, it was capable of, of there were beds for about 5,000 people. Wow. Uh, so a massive building. Um, but there was actually only half a dozen of us there. There was myself from Rhodesia. And there was um, a couple of guys from Northern Ireland and a couple of guys who were temporarily, temporarily there from the Second World War. So I spent quite a long time there, um, you know, doing Braille and, and typing and mobility and that sort of thing. And they were quite keen for me to stay in the UK and pursue a career there. Um, but... I'd met Karen, my family, all my family were in Rhodesia. So I wanted to return, which, which I did. So, um, yeah, so one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to try and pursue a career in IT. And at that stage, some blind people had um, gone into programming, certainly in the UK. Right. And 
So I, I thought that I would pursue that. And I managed to find a lady, um, Irene Anderson, who was a lecturer at the Polytechnic. Um, I met with her and she agreed to sort of train me as a computer programmer outside her no normal working hours. So she would, she would come round after work and spend time with me and the weekends and so on. And we did that for a couple of years. <coughs> and so it was a very big commitment from her. I'm very grateful for the effort that she put in. And so I, I was trained to be a computer programmer. And um, it took me, so then, then came the issue of trying to find a job. And it took me a while. And eventually I found a, a, a guy called Roy Osborne at, at CABS, Central Africa Building Society. And he was quite progressive in his thinking. And he said, yeah, no, we'll give you a go. Um, and CABS employed me on a, on a sort of provisional basis uh, as a trainee computer programmer. And um, that's where my career started. Well, uh, Russ, I just want to chip in there again and just say uh, a word about about cabs because yeah. um, I think they were fantastic the way they looked after chaps who'd been hurt. Another another guy who um, found a job and security at cabs was Dij O'Donnell. Who, exactly. Who was also um, a national serviceman, but a lieutenant, I think. Dij, and like you, very, yes. very good sportsman um, yes. who also got uh, su suffered severe head, in head, in head, in head injuries, as you probably remember. Um, yes. And, and cabs were, you know, I can remember some of those top guys at cabs, Full Cameron, one of them, and they were yes. very, very good to, to these guys. So it's nice to hear they stepped in to give you a start as well. Yeah, so Dij O'Donnell and I were at the School of Infantry together. And when he, when, when he finished there, I think he was deployed with the RAR. And he was injured after a contact. Um, he, 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 they, he turned a gook over and he was holding a grenade. And the grenade went off and hit uh, Dij in the forehead, I think. So... Yeah. Yeah, Ditch, Ditch's problem was that his his memory was good, but his short term memory was non existent. Yes. So he could remember everything that um, you know happened prior to his injury. Like he 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 remembered me. He re, you know his memory was impeccable, but every day when he went to work, he had to be retrained. Yes. Um, so yeah, that was. Yeah, cabs were good. They 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 looked after the chair, definitely. So from cabs, you stayed there for a while? Yeah, so so cabs was um good. I started work there and there was a young um programmer there who um sort of assisted me on several levels. He he helped me um he taught me a lot as a as a Christian. And also he was an absolutely brilliant programmer. And um, he, he taught me a lot in terms of programming and so on and helped me get my career started. And over the years, I progressed at CABS. Um, I, I, I was promoted to, to senior programmer and then ultimately to, to the systems development manager. And I was a systems development manager at CABS for, I think, about 11 years before I left CABS in 2002 to, to bring my family to New Zealand. Um, I don't know, um, Hannes, do you think it would be of interest to people um, to tell them how a blind person can access a computer? Yes, I think it would be, Russ. Give us some, okay. some idea. I'm certainly very interested. So when I started at CABS in, in 1981, 
um, everything was done on cards. So you, you punched your program onto these punch cards and each card represented one line of code. So I was able to operate the punch machine so I could punch my program onto these cards. But once you'd done that, you got a printout and I couldn't read the printout. <coughs> so Karen had to be my reader. So I'd come home from work every day and Karen and I would go through these printouts. And so we worked um, every night till about midnight and we pretty much worked every weekend. So we did that for <coughs> about three years until um, I got a, a braille terminal and that had little uh, metallic pins right. that magnetically popped up and down like uh, making like a synthetic braille display. And um, so that gave me independence, um, let Karen off the hook. She didn't have to read the printouts anymore because I could read them using my, my braille terminal. And then I think it was about um, 1988 or 89 that speech synthesizers became available. Okay. And so okay. you could plug a little a speech synthesizer into a port on your PC. And so you could then get speech output right. um, from your computer. So as information comes up on the screen, um, it would be spoken through this little speech synthesizer. And now today, um, we, I don't need a, a, a speech synthesizer, but I just have software on my computer. And information that comes up on the screen gets spoken through the speakers. So, um, so whereas you would see the information coming up on the screen, I just get an audible output. So apart from that, I access the computer, same as you do. I still use the keyboard, I'm obviously a touch type typer. So I, I use the keyboard pretty much like you do, but I just get voice output. So yeah, that's, that's, that's how a blind person can access a computer. Russ, um, what precipitated your move to New Zealand in 2002? Is there a story there? What just... There's a definitely a story there because because in the next door office to me um, was a lady called Laura Olds and she was sister-in-law to Martin Olds, right. um, who you that name will ring a bell. Yes, I knew Martin. So he was killed in 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 Bulawayo area. Yeah, I'm not sure where. Yeah. And and she didn't arrive at work one day. And I said to, to all the staff, um, you know, does anybody know where Laura was? And she was actually on um, a plane flying down to Bulawayo to her and, and Dave were gonna go and try and recover his body. And um, <clears throat> I came home from work at the end of that day. And I said to Karen, uh, look, time to move on because I'm paying taxes to support a regime which is killing people and it's just you can't be doing this. So we decided then that it was time to go. It took us a couple of years to, to get the wheels in motion, but um, then we moved to, to New Zealand in 2002, um, brought uh, my family, I had three sons, uh, brought them with, with us. And um, and some years later, um, there was a young 12-year-old girl who had been deserted by her parents and she needed a home. So we took her in and then a few years later, we adopted her. So I actually have four children, three, three sons and a, a daughter. Russell, what a fantastic story. Yeah. Um, so... So I had, um, I had quite a good CV. I was quite well known in the IT industry in Zimbabwe. So I assumed that um, I would be able to get um, 
get work um, in the IT industry in New Zealand. And I think I applied for something in the order of 200 jobs and didn't even get an interview. So I quickly realized that I was going to have to um, do something for ourselves. And what we did is Karen and I bought a, a, a kindergarten for her to run because in Zimbabwe, she'd been running her own nursery school for about seven years. So we bought that business and Karen managed that. <coughs> and then a, a year or so later, Karen's brother um, left Zimbabwe and came to New Zealand and him and I started an IT company and we developed software for the childcare industry. Okay. And we sold that, sold that business about a year ago. And um, so I'm now retired and enjoying it. <laughs> well, Russell, you deserve everything you've got, my, my friend. Uh, your story is an amazing one. And I must say, incredibly inspirational certainly for me, and I'm sure for a lot of other people, just um, a reminder of how lucky so many of us are. And um, you certainly set a shining example of Rhodesian resilience and generosity and kindness. Um, uh, I salute you and I really appreciate having your story on the record here. And I'm sure a lot of people out there are going to, um, are going to listen and learn and, uh, and like me, uh, probably appreciate what they have um, ever more, because it is a, a very strong reminder of how tough life can be for some people. Yeah, well, Hannes, look, I, I just want to thank you as well for the series you've been doing. I've actually I only sort of found it a, a few weeks ago, and I've really enjoyed having a having a listen to to the guys. It brings back old memories, some of them happy and some of them sad. But I think it's important that you know we do have this on record. Mm. Um, yeah, because it was a part of history and. Uh, I, 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 I saw that you you actually had <coughs> the story from both sides, which I also thinks thinks a good thing. Yes. So I, well done. I would I would very much like to get more of the more of the black um, fighting people involved, but for other for various reasons, it's been it's proved quite difficult to do. But yes. um, yeah, I, I really like you. Um, I'm interested in the history. I'm not trying yeah, to, to push one side or the other. I just want people to tell the truth and get our story on the record for posterity. And um, mm. I think because I think we've got an enormous amount to be proud of. And we live in a world where um, we're all being reminded every almost every day that uh, We've got a, a legacy of abuse and slavery and colonialism and stuff, and it actually sickens yes. me. Um, and if I can do a little bit to to put the record straight, then I then I'm happy for doing it. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, the guys who attacked our camp. Uh, I mean, actually, I don't hold anything against them. Um, so if I ever met any of them, it would all be good. So yeah, I, I I'm I'm grateful that you are doing this and um, and getting getting a few stories from the other side as well. I think it's excellent. Thanks again, Russ. We'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks, Hannes. Cheers, boys. Stay safe. Cheers.